OK, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Roseanne Sorelli from Sharp Richard. Um, welcome on this lovely sunny Friday afternoon. Um, really lovely to have you here. You can see from some of the names, there's quite a lot of familiar faces and familiar names coming through already. So hello to everybody that is, is already um, uh, uh, somebody I know very well um, and very much welcome to everybody else. Um, I'm going to be um, presenting for the next sort of 40 minutes or so alongside my colleague Julie Lau, um, who's also um, on, on screen with us today. Um, now we are going to be talking about COVID-19 and PFI contracts. We're very much with a um, practical emphasis. So, so many of you probably have had lots and lots of legal advice and we'll certainly be touching on some of that. But the real emphasis today is to talk about some top tips and practical um, advice for you in managing PFI contracts. And for those of you who haven't um, uh, got a PFI contract per se, in the sense of it's not a contract that is supported by PFI credits from central government, um, this is still really relevant because most of what we're going to be talking about will also apply to any sort of major PPP arrangement. Um, a lot of the principles in PFI uh, PPPs, whether credited or not, are, are very similar. So, so certainly lots of relevance. Um, so, Julie, would you like to say hello? Hi, yes, my name is Julie Lau and like Roz, I'm in the infrastructure team at Sharp Pritchard. I'm a senior associate and my focus is mainly on advising clients on contracts, um, contract law, as well as public procurement law. And I will be speaking to you again a little later on. Awesome, thank you. Right, OK, so if we go over to the slides, um, and we'll we'll start now. Questions and answers. There's two ways that you can ask us questions. Um, one is that if you click on the right hand side of your screens on the little taskbar, you'll see some bubbles, and that will give you a place where you can put written questions in. Um, and when Julie and I aren't talking, we'll both be keeping a BDI on the written questions, and we'll we'll come in and uh, and answer some of those either in writing or. Or, or if we get time at the end, I'll try and pick up some of them in, in camera for you. Um, if you are thinking about wanting to ask something that's a little bit more involved or, or indeed after we've finished, then please feel free through the COVID um, helpline at Sharp Pritchard. Please don't feel that when we stop at four o'clock, that's the end of it. Do feel free to, to put more specific or maybe commercially confidential questions through that route as well. And we'll be really happy. Um, to, to try and answer some of those. OK, so that's us. Um, and we will, incidentally, we will, if anybody would like it, we will be very happy to share this presentation with you afterwards. So just again, feel free to just contact us and we'll um, send you a copy of the slides. OK, so this is a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at a little bit of the law, so force majeure, change in law, emergency provisions. Um, but more than anything, as I say, towards the end, we're going to be looking ahead to what we, it's a transition for when we come out of lockdown and also some practical advice as to what you can and should probably be doing now. So first of all, I'm going to touch on the guidance that's come out for central government, and that's predominantly been, and most of you will have seen it, through three channels. So we've had um, procurement policy notes that have come out um, through the, the CCS and, and the procurement side of government. Then we've got the infrastructure, the major projects, infrastructure, um, projects authority for major infrastructure, and they've obviously given very good guidance on the um, PFI contracts themselves. And then also we're getting guidance through from Cabinet Office and the government commercial function. All of those um, pieces of advice are broadly saying the same thing, um, but with a very slightly different emphasis, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through what that is. Um, so first of all, I mean, the first thing that came out of the door pretty much at the start of everything and that underpins really everything we're going to say is um, the PPN number one, which was relating to the procurement law. Um, so we've talked here about PCR. Obviously, those of you and I know there's one or two online that are probably more interested in UCR, um, but this applies pretty much an identical way, um, just slightly different regulations, but the same words. Um, so there are um, two 
probable there's there two areas of the regulations that really come into focus um, one is regulation 32 which allows you to negotiate a contract where you've got urgent uh, extreme urgency um, and regulation 721 c which is all about safe harbors for modifications so very briefly you'll, you'll all know this anyway that once you've let a contract under the um, pcr you can't then go and just modify it out of sight um, if you did that, then you might as well have avoided the procurement rules in the first place. So following some very high level, uh, high, high profile cases, Pressetex and others, the government said, uh, the, the, sorry, the EU said, no, if you're going to modify a contract, you can't do it unless it meets one of the safe harbours. And by and large, um, Evil lawyers like us are forever telling our public sector clients, really sorry, you can't modify your contract unless it meets one of these safe harbours. And very often it's quite hard to get within one of them. Um, but where we are within the um, UCR, uh, the COVID situation at the moment, um, I think there's very little doubt at all that we come into the a safe harbour that's in Regulation 1C, which allows you to modify a contract. Um, However, and the second bullet there is really important practical tip is don't forget about what's called the proportionality rules. So we're under EU law, um, even once we get out of um, the um, e European Union, the government procurement um, agreement and, uh, and the UK regulations will have the same principle embedded into it, um, which is a, 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 a rule called proportionality. And what it's basically saying is just because you can modify a contract because there's a, 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 an extreme urgency or there's an unforeseen circumstance, you shouldn't be modifying it to a degree that's unnecessary given the circumstances. So, for example, if you need to extend a contract because it would come out for renewal sort of in the next few months and, uh, uh, and a change of contractor is really undesirable or impractical, then it's reasonable to extend it maybe for a year, maybe for two years. What wouldn't be reasonable is to then extend it for the next 10 years at this stage at any rate. So, um, so proportionality is, is really important to extend it for a reasonable time or change it in a reasonable way. Um, uh, uh, to make the necessary modifications. And I think that word necessary is quite important there. Um, the second PPN that came out, so so, so that, that PPN is really just explaining what probably we all sort of knew instinctively, that we are in a world where we can vary contracts that in other circumstances we, we wouldn't be able to vary. Um, PPN 2 came out very shortly after PPN 1 and really set the tone of everything that followed. Um, what PPN 2 is really saying is, look, the philosophy of what is coming out of central government is preserve services and keep supply chain alive. What we don't want to happen over the next few months is for the measures that are taken in relation to PFI and PPP contracts is to um, uh, in impede services to prevent them being provided and to cause insolvencies down the supply chain. That's not going to be in anybody's interests either in the public service world or indeed for when it comes to, to, to wanting competition it, when we come to relet these contracts or, or relet similar contracts. So the philosophy of the guidance is very much about preservation. Um, now, I think a lot of people saw that, read the sort of first couple of lines and thought, well, there we go, the government is very much saying, keep everything going, agree to whatever the contractors want. Um, but actually it wasn't quite as widely drafted as that. And if you look at some of the detail, you'll see that actually there are some um, modifications to that. There's, there's, there's some ways in which that's constrained. Um, so look, for example, as to what it says around identifying contractors at risk. Right, which is interpreted locally. The guidance doesn't intend to, to, to put a, um, a definition around at risk. So what, what is a contractor at risk? Well, a contractor might be at risk of insolvency. Also, they might be a contractor that's providing a service which itself would be at risk um, if, if, if the service doesn't continue to get provided in the, in the way the contractor is used to. So. Um, it, it's not saying just allow every contract just to, to, to have whatever measures you need to put into place to allow them to continue. It's very much saying look, what do you need to put into place, what's at risk, what do we need to preserve. Um, 
two important principles there, ensuring payments continue down the supply chain and transparency and open book. And that's really important. That open book philosophy is really, really important, as you'll see later, um, being able to sort of keep a control, can keep um, a, a clear as to what's being changed and why is really important, particularly when we go back into usual steady state. Um, the government has said that advanced payments might be acceptable. Normally, of course, in PFI world, you wouldn't make advanced payments to a contractor. Um, obviously, those of you who are local authorities will have to take the view of your Section 151 officers. But the guidance says that for those who are central government, your accounting officers have been told under managing public money that you've got clearance to make um, advanced payments at least until mid-June. Um, and then the government will revise things or so review things after that. So then we had um, uh, th those two pieces of advice came out quite quickly. Then we had um, the, the, the Infrastructure Project Authority, the IPA guidance that came out very soon after on the 2nd of April. Now, um, some of you might have been on the, the um, webinar that the IPA itself did on this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and if you were, you'll have heard of some of these messages already. But I, you'd also have heard some of the things that I was saying um, around the impact of this, because um, the IPA's guidance is very heavily focused on service continuity, right? the emphasis that PFI contractors should see themselves and be seen as being part of the public response. All right, so you're expecting your PFI contractors to act as public servants, as act as if they were in the public sector. They are as much part of the response to COVID as the public sector itself. So my question to those of you who are listening and managing PFI contracts, do they? Are your PFI contractors acting with that public interest hat on in the same way as you as pub, private se uh, public sector are? Now, I, I think here my, my advice would be to be a bit careful here, right? And not to assume that just because as contracting authorities, as the public sector, you're assuming that everybody's acting in the public interest. Don't assume that they aren't carefully looking at their contract, their rights, and waiting to see or, 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 or putting notes down as to what they might be able to claim later on. Now, that's not to say that I'm suggesting that they're, that they're being in any way um, unhelpful. What I'm saying is they are the PFI contractors and their shareholders that are commercial animals and they will be looking as of course they will need to at the financial impact of COVID on their business on the PFI contract. And we shouldn't assume that everybody's just going to put the contract to one side and not bring it out again later on. And I'm going to come back to that theme a little bit later. OK, the other the second thing to be careful about is that contracting authorities should not be replacing Treasury. All right. So the Treasury has obviously provided a whole number of schemes to help business, one of which, for example, is the furlough scheme. All right. And you as contracting authorities, as as the counterparties to PFI, should expect your um, PFI contractors to be deploying as many of the resources as they can to mitigate the impact of COVID on their um, commercial operations and those of their supply chains, just as any other business would be. So as contracting authorities, as, as counterparts to PFI and PPP, the emphasis is, is about service continuity, not about preserving profits or business continuity. That's something for the Treasury, that's something for your contractors and their shareholders. So it's all about preserving and doing what you need to do to ensure that that PFI can continue and that service can continue, not necessarily putting the contractors, uh, preserving the contractors profit. Um, the third thing there is to, to note, and this is quite an important one, is we'd expect that bespoke contractual documents will be used to implement temporary arrangements in PFI contracts. All right, I'll come back to that point in a minute. All right, because it's really important. But my tip there is draft a specific modification deed. Right, we'll come back to it. I've said what I think I needs to go into it. But there's lots of mechanics in the PFI contracts for making changes and may and dealing with um, issues and circumstances. But um, there is also the guidance, and Julie's going to talk about it about um, changes and variations. But our advice is to 
draft something specific that you can use across all your contractors. OK, so um, again, sticking to the um, guidance, so sticking to the IPA guidance, I just thought you might find this quite interesting. So this is the first, this is the introductory couple of paragraphs from the guidance. And my, the, the underlining there is my emphasis, all right? So I just wanted to show you some things here. So PFI contractors should now see themselves as part of the public sector response to COVID, all right? So that's the point I was making. Right, when you're talking to your PFI contractors, you need to get them to make sure they've got that public cat on. Right? They are not now looking at things from the point of view of just their return and their stakeholders. Right? So look at the next line. Contracting authorities must reciprocate, right? but reciprocate there. Right? So it's assuming this is a two way street. Right? It's assuming that the contractors have done their bit in the first paragraph. Right, so they, it should not be all of the contractors coming to you as public sector and saying COVID is awful, we've been shot to bits financially, we can't provide the service, we need you to help us. Right, it's got to be a two way street, it's got to be them looking at ways to help the continuity of the, continuity of the service and to mitigate the impact. And then you reciprocate. Right? Despite the best endeavours of the PFI contractors, right, performance is impacted despite the best efforts of the PFI contractors. Again, best efforts of the PFI contractors. Again, just showing you there that you can and should be expecting your contractors to, to deploy what's you know, a high standard there, best endeavours, uh, sorry, best efforts. Uh, there should be a temporary moratorium on related payment and performance. Now, this is quite an important point, and I don't think I've covered it in the later slides. So I'll just mention it now. Um, when you come to put into measures into place, many of you have got PFI contracts which are volume based, whether it's usage of a facility or usage of an amount of energy or a capacity for waste, etc. It may well be that usage has fallen through the floor over the last month or two and will continue to fall through the floor. But that, once the crisis is abated a bit, that actually usage goes the other way and there's a, 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 an overload of, of need. Um, and what we're advising clients is to include in any arrangements you make a, um, some form of reconciliation at the end of the year so that what you're not doing is if you like, just compensating or helping the contractors now and then find actually they get overcompensated, they get they get more later on in the year and you've ended up sort of doubly compensating them, if you like, or they, they, they're getting sort of, you know, future future income at a very high level as well as having things preserved now. Um, so, you know, I think it's quite important that you, 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 you include some form of reconciliation. Um, another tip there is some of you will have PFI letters of credits or promissory notes um, and do check what your letter says and make sure your relevant department is informed. And the reason I say that is that I've had quite a lot of clients over the years make changes for perfectly valid reasons, sometimes obviously not to the level of COVID, but in similar-ish sort of local circumstances of a crisis or something. And even though what they're putting into place is really sensible and agreed with the contractor, the department might say you didn't get approval at which you were bound to do under your letter of credits um, and you should have done. So my advice is always to double check what your letter says and double check whether you need to confirm anything with your departments before you agree to it with the contractor. OK, so with that canter through the guidance, um, I'm going to go on to sort of just touch briefly. I'm not going to spend too long on this, um, on, on some of these um, legal principles. Um, so force measure and what you'll see here, I'm going to sort of set you a little Friday bit of fun. I, I asked uh, one of my trainees to, to re put some to put some logos and pictures in here just to, to brighten them up. And I don't know how trainee solicitors minds work these days because they're not quite the same. I've, I've struggled to work out the relevance of some of the pictures and then we've the penny's dropped and it's, it's quite funny. So see if you can, can work them out. But force measure here, obviously, we've got a, a bit of inclement weather, a bit of a thunderstorm going on. What's force measure? Well, is usually an exceptional event. And, and the, the first two lines there are really important. It's either physically or legally impossible to meet the terms of the contract. 
Okay, force majeure isn't something that is just going to make it difficult right, or expensive. It makes it impossible or, or physically impossible. Now, whether COVID-19 amounts to force majeure um, has been the subject of much debate. Um, uh, and it really does, <laughs> I, have to, I hate to say this, but it really does depend on the form of contract and, and the words that you've used. Um, it can't be implied, right? Force measure is a contractual mechanism. It's either expressly written in or it isn't. Um, um, and, and as I say, it will depend on the contract in question as to A, what it means and B, how it's used. Um, just a word here, don't confuse force majeure with a similar doctrine, which is the doctrine of frustration. Right? Now, frustration is a contractual concept, but it's not, um, it's, it's common law rather than a, a drafted concept. And what it means is that if the contract becomes wholly irrelevant or impossible, um, not, not just more expensive or, or more difficult, but if it becomes just irrelevant, then um, uh, frustration might be available and not many contracts have ever been declared frustrated and haven't met not many even in this circumstance have been frustrated but a classic example those of you who are in for example the higher education center uh, sector is where for example exam papers you might have a contract to, to, to publish exam papers and the exams have been cancelled and you know, and so it's just frustrated the entire point of the contract. Um, but it is a high bar. Um, but and bear in mind the difference between the contractual remedy of force majeure and the common law remedy of frustration is that if you declare a contract frustrated, then the contract just disappears. So everybody's rights and remedies are preserved up to the date it disappeared. But after that, you can't sue each other. You can't claim anything because it's it's just gone. Whereas obviously force majeure, you follow what the contract says. Um, and in some cases, and in PFI, it usually is the case that if a contract is terminated through force measure, the contractor will still get his compensation uh, on termination. So does it apply to PFI? Well, again, as I say, it depends on your contract, um, but usually in PFI, it's not going to, it's not expressly included or it's not, it's not clearly included. So in SOPC4, um, the newest we've got is to something called biological contamination. And it's, an, it's by a long way not clear cut that biological contamination um, will apply. Um, and the reason for that, some of you might have um, insurance policies um, where there is a business interruption element. And the business interruption element, elephant, element, even it is the elephant in the room actually, because what it often talks about is contamination at the site. Right, or at the premises, right? So there's been lots of debates um, whether, you know, there's no doubt that COVID is biological, right? Although I say that, even, there are some people even denying that a virus is, is a creature. It's not even that it's not biological, it's chemical. Um, uh, but let's assume we can at least um, find it uh, within the context of biology. Um, is it contamination? Well, it's, you know, arguably not because it's 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 harbors in people potentially briefly on surfaces but broadly in people so there's by a long way there's lots of commentary that says biological contamination is not for um it, it is not a um a virus and as i say in the insurance sector they're very much linking it to contamination at a site a physical place that's what contamination means doesn't mean infection if you like um however even if your contract does include pandemic, and I have seen one or two that do, um, don't forget that it means that it's got to be physically or legally impossible to perform the obligations. I, um, now, the IPA guidance says that contractors are unlikely to be able to demonstrate that force measure applies because it might be that it's more expensive for them to provide the service, but they're not absolutely hindered from providing it. But of course, there are where you've got lockdown, you've got closed doors in places, then obviously that that probably would Kate, uh, be covered. Um, but do note if your contractors are saying force majeure applies, that force majeure applies if it applies. In other words, it applies to both parties, right? So it arguably pre um, prevents, um, you know, it, it, it obviously excuses the authority as well for maybe making um, uh, um, facilities available. Um, 
The consequences of force majeure, uh, and the really important thing is what we've underlined, which is the point is, it's the duty on both parties to mitigate the practical effects. You can't just claim force majeure, right? You've got to be able to show you tried to perform notwithstanding the force majeure. And like I say, just being harder to perform isn't enough. I, but even if, if, you, if you mitigate and you still can't get there, then there's often a period um, in PFI contracts where one party or the other, after usually six months, can terminate the contract. Right? And in PFI contracts, that's usually as far as it goes. In other words, it's protection against having to, it's, it's a protection against the, the authority uh, terminating early. The authority has to allow the force majeure to work through for a period, but ultimately allows both parties to get out if it's a very long term impact. Right? Force majeure is often not in there. Most of PFIs I've seen, it's not in there to manage the actual um, payments and service between the parties while the force majeure is ongoing. It's about termination. Um, so, so very often um, it, you continue to provide uh, to, to pay the contractor very often they don't get any relief from their um, obligations to perform but what they do get relief from is the termination. So how should you respond if your contractor says force measure? Well firstly is it? Um, secondly what does the contract say about the time limits? Um, my guess is if you haven't already triggered force measure provisions between you, you're probably out of time because you know, the force measure instant happened some time ago now. Um, but that doesn't mean um, to say there's nothing you can do about it, you can agree. Um, but the contractors must show those thing, three things that I've said there. They must be able to show what the force measure event is, how the performance has been affected and how they intend to mitigate. Um, and, and something I don't think I've, I've not really said on this slide, but, but I think is, is really important, is this whole thing about the long going relationship, right? It's a long term relationship. So they need to, they, they need to be able to show what, what, how they're going to deal with things in the longer term. Firm but fair. Um, now this comes, um, I think, from the um, other, the, the final bit of guidance we haven't touched on yet, which is the um, guidance of the, and this came from the Cabinet Office on the on the 7th of May. So sort of this is the government commercial function and it really sort of went over everything that both the um, uh, Infrastructure Project Authority and the CCS are saying. Um, and what they're saying is take a firm but fair approach. They're looking for authorities to um, make sure that they implement their response to COVID with their PFI contractors in a, in a way that's reasonable, a, re a way that's fair, but a way that is firm. All right, so be flexible and make be supportive, but don't prejudice your position. And we're going to come back to all of that a little bit later. Um, as I said, the IPA's guidance is on service continuity and, uh, and make sure that we're being pragmatic when we track that, but we're, we're going to come back to this theme a little bit later. So I'm going to hand over, I think, to Julie for a few moments um, to talk about some of the other very familiar themes in PFI that no doubt you've all um, had to grapple with in the past and are grappling with now. Julie. Thank you, Roz. Thank you, Roz. So changes in law um, is the next um, item we're going to look at. And I think particularly it becomes relevant as we move out of um, the sort of immediate, um, you know, COVID-19 hitting and, and when everyone was scrambling to look at force majeure terms, as we just discussed. And I think um, at this point, as we look in at things like social distancing, as lockdown measures are imposed and then eased, um, this idea of changes in law kind of really comes into the limelight, I think. So my next slide looks at how, um, you know, the fact that actually COVID-19 has led to a number of significant legislative changes and um, and contractors may now seek to rely on change in law provisions instead, especially you know, given what Ros just explained about how force majeure definitions and using that that approach may not be as straightforward or may not provide the sort of comfort they were looking for. So we, if, if we just move on to the next um, slide. Okay. What is it? PFI con in PFI contracts, you've got change in law provisions. No doubt most of you will be uh, very aware of those. Um, and yeah, if, I mean, in brief, what happens is if you, you claim change in law, 
they may, subject to certain qualifications or certain caveats being met, they may relieve the contractor from penalty for um, it, it, under the contract as a result, you know, if they if they end up in non-performance or perhaps not performing up to the standard because of new legislation that is in place that they also have to comply with. Um, this is when it applies. Um, in the next slide, I think I mentioned then, yeah, the fact that law is actually broadly, often broadly defined in PFI contracts. The standard drafting makes it broad enough to include things like relevant government guidance, um, directions that the contractor is bound to comply with. So things like the Construction Leadership Council's site operating procedures, for example, I think it's safe to assume that they would fall under such a definition of guidance. And obviously the contractors in that context would be required to comply with those. Um, you also, you know, things like, like I mentioned, lockdown and social distancing measures, those are actually being captured in legislation as well. So they could very easily fall under definitions of law. But again, you, you kind of have to look to the actual regulations rather than the what's kind of being bandied around, I think, to, to really know what the requirements are that contractors have to comply with. Um, also, just a point, a, a sort of tip to note is that there are constantly amendments being made to those regulations. So the, the regulations in that contain the social distancing measures are called the health protection coronavirus restrictions <laughs> regulations um, <laughs> and there's an England one and a Wales one so just beware I think some police authorities I think I saw on the news kind of were, were, were charging people under the wrong set of regulations so just want to really be aware of and, and just to note that the regulations are being amended new um, SIs are being statutory instruments are being issued and some of them have specific uh, measures relating to say the waste sector or say to you know schools or whatever so it's just important to keep an eye on that and to see whether any of these changes in law are going to affect you. Um, I think um, yeah so further also just a point to note that actually the fact is that under standard PFI contract um, you've got only you've got this idea of a qualifying change in law and those are ones where the authority then bears the risk if it's something that's defined under the contract as qualifying and those tend to be defined as PFI specific or at least specific to that particular sector or industry that you're looking at and therefore general changes in law um, that affect everyone in the country are not likely to going uh, are not likely to apply here. However, as I just mentioned, I think it is important to keep an eye on industry specific changes that might just affect your contractor or your sector, and then the qualifying change might bite. So yes, on the next slide, we look at just what again, how should you respond if someone if a contractor does seek relief under the contract using the change in law provision, very similarly to the force majeure approach you, I don't, you you have to make sure we're clear about which legislation we're talking about how it specifically affects either pfi generally or that particular service in question um, and how and the contractor usually under the contract under the change in law provision is going to be required to show how that is th therefore an authority risk rather than the contractor risk it will also be required to show how it's mitigated the effects of those changes how it's sought to respond to those legislative changes without um, you know while mitigating its costs and its and, and the resources it's used to respond to those um, as with force majeure our view is that absent kind of specific legislative changes to those sectors your contractors are going to struggle I think to just demonstrate that general changes in law are going to apply um, under the PFI sort of drafting um, and yes the next slide emergencies um, I'm going to counter through these actually because I am aware that also there's probably a lot of um, and people are keen to get to some of the specifics that, that Ros mentioned earlier as to how you go about making some of these changes. But the emergencies provisions, um, usually if they are there in any PFI contracts um, and um, for example, the waste in this waste infrastructure delivery form, the, the WIDIP standard waste form, you, you'll have things like emergencies, a clause that allows the contractor, sorry, the authority, and actually that's a very specific, a very key point, the authority um, allows the authority to to, to instruct and say there's been an emergency this is the clause we're going to use and this is why we think there's an emergency and this is what we want you to do so um, because it is authority led and because it is something they can call upon rather than something that happens it is usually much more broadly defined than force majeure and probably in most contracts if, it, if there is such a provision it is likely to cover something like COVID-19 as a public health emergency um, but you know Again, this is something that the authority chooses to use, uh, chooses to switch on, and 
uh, with that, it's not a free of charge situation. It's things where you, you agree the changes in cost, you agree what the contractor has to do, any mitigation it has to do. Um, but the effect of that is that usually when there are such provisions, an emergency is likely to then amount to an excusing cause or any or similarly so similar types of provisions that then provides the contractor with some sort of relief for non-performance um, and allows the authority to agree a new way forward for that for that period of time. Um, while probably not in PFI kind of standard PFI contracts um, in PPP contracts generally, there may be, or in other contracts actually, there may be some mention of the Civil Contingencies Act 2004. And again, that provides a very wide definition of emergency. Um, the government has not chosen to use this act at the moment and instead has enacted a specific coronavirus act to, to deal with all the measures and the, and the legislation under that. But this is always a, the CCA is obviously available to the government to use um, if that if they need it. And if it is mentioned in a contract, it may be that, again, the authority, the contracting authority then has the right to pass on some of the compliance with that legislation or any legislation passed under it, uh, regulations passed under it to the contractors. Um, but it, that will function in a similar way to the emergency provisions I just described. So we move on then to actually service continuity. And as Ros mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that's, that is really the main theme of the government guidance that's been coming through, and which makes sense. And I think the question then is how do you balance the fact that you do need service continuity? Government is telling you that that is what you need to try to ensure. And of course, that's what you'd hope to do as a contracting authority. But if faced with a contractor that is just unable to go on as normal or, you know, not or at least it may be that it affects costing. It may be that it affects their access to resources, their staff, if, if we're talking about um, people in social distancing or just health issues, um, it may affect time timing issues, delays to works or longer lead ins to things um, or just simply that it takes longer to get things done because of social distancing requirements, for example. So there can be lots of different ways that a contractor and a contract might be affected. Its service, its performance might be affected or simply that the costs of it um, are impacted. But how do we deal with that while trying to keep the contract going? Um, so I mean, generally, I think authorities are trying to collaborate and apply these themes, and the principles contained in the second PPN that the Cabinet Office issued as far as possible. Um, and I think one, well, I mean, one again, a tip to note is just that the PPN was published, O220 was published in March, but it has since been updated several times and the FAQs that are attached to that on the website, on the government's website have been um, constantly updated. So just a point as well to keep checking that that website and looking through the actual FAQ document because they seem to keep adding questions and answers to it really helpful ones but um, for example it was just updated on Tuesday this week I think um, and sometimes there's quite specific sector guidance as well for example on construction industry or um, there was some guidance for state schools as well also just bearing worth checking dates so at the moment it's that PPN is stated to have effect until the 30th of June so that's only just over a month from now um, so it's just worth checking that I mean I wouldn't be surprised if that date shifted but it would just be um, important to to check that it's still up to date um, and I think the second the th yeah, the second bullet point now on this slide talks about the fact that the, the advice is to use contractual measures that are available under your contract as far as possible. However, we, you know, as most of you have looked at the change con control procedure, or I should say schedule in a PFI contract, will see that it is very comprehensive. It is it contains lots of time scales, and it may not be something that is. Um, Really, really feasible for you right now at this point in time. So there may be a need to then look at maybe agreeing some emergency kind of short form version and try to pre-agree the impacts of that if if it's possible. Um, and but if you are using what is what is provided under the contract, then of course make sure you check things like time periods or even things like addresses for service, which in today's world, it might throw out a whole other um, issue, but it's just important to make sure you're then complying with those prescribed mechanisms if that's what you're using. But um, I think what I just wanted to mention that there's also the um, 
under the PPN 02, there was also issued a model interim payment notice. Um, and although it's specifically stated as not applying to PFI, and now this is a notice which allows you to adjust the payment mechanisms to, for example, give your contractor an advance payment or um, ad adjust the mechanism so that it, it gets paid, the contractor gets paid more, um, or just differently to assist that whole service to, to provide for service continuity. So there's a model form there. It doesn't apply to PFI, strictly speaking, but I do think that it does provide some helpful principles for understanding what you do need to, con to, to capture in a variation. And as Roz alluded to before, she will go into a bit more detail as to how you can actually go about doing that. Fabulous. Thank you, um, Julie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We've got one more slide. <laughs> I just, say, I, just to say, actually, I think I've just realised what the logo is there. We're squaring the circle. So it's... Ah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Squaring the circle. question answered. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, well, that logo, I think, something about sliding on the line. Uh, um, but uh, implementing changes. Um, yeah, so just a couple more points just to say, you know, bearing in mind, what are some of the other things to just bear in mind as you go about making these changes? Um, the fact that you still have statutory duties as contracting authorities to comply with, some of them may have been relaxed slightly by the current regulations, but, um, but you know, the IPA guidance actually makes it very clear that things like um, health and safety, for example, should never be put at risk. And so any changes that you agree should not be compromising that. Um, I mentioned the second point already, so I won't go into that. And the, th and the third point in that slide um, is just about the public procurement rules continuing to apply. So having that at the back of your minds as well as you go about making, um, trying to make any changes. And again, Roz has gone through those, so I won't um, repeat them. I think the next slide then is just to come back really, yeah, tra the transition slide is just to come back to where I started with the fact that I think as situation evolves and changes you the, the cause of the inability to perform the contract whether at all or just to the usual standards or under the usual mechanism may then evolve as government puts in place new rules new restrictions new sector specific guidance um, and so it's important to kind of for for our approach for, as contracting authorities to sort of move with that as well um, and also the fact that um, you've got to I think just bear in mind that the session has been looking at navigating ongoing contracts um, because I think that's clearly the immediate um, concern. But as you kind of look forward and start planning, I think, you know, don't forget that in the budget that was pre-COVID or just about as COVID was um, kind of kicking off, um, there was promised a vast amount of infrastructure funding. And so I think it's also worth kind of having in mind what all this means as we navigate new contracts potentially. Um, and the final point there, just about resilience planning, in most PFI contracts, you'll have provisions about BCDR, so business continuity, disaster recovery, that sort of thing. Um, if not already in place, make sure, uh, the tip there is to just make sure that the resilience plan, those BCDR plans are there, are up to date. Um, usually there will be provisions for updating those and making sure you have updated information from your contractor about their accounts, the business situation, asset registers, supply chain information. So so just now would be probably a good time to make sure those are all up to date. You've got the latest information um, and there is if, if you need more guidance on that, actually, the government has issued a really helpful and um, the outsourcing playbook has a really uh, useful section on resolution planning to give more ideas about what you might need to consider. So that's it for me. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Julie. Um, so I'm just going to come back to um, some practical advice. Um, so just this is really just bringing everything that we've just been talking about, all the guidance, all those little ingredients, put them all together into something that gives you a sort of um, a, a way forward. Um, and I, I'm going to litter this really um, unashamedly with some of our sort of pet themes that we, we're advising our clients because I think they're really important. Um, so, so the first bullet is what we've already said, which is the reasonable and fair behaviour. Um, so the non-statutory guidance from the Cabinet Office on the 7th of May. Um, I think that's quite important for those of you who are having to get um, uh, approvals, um, either from your departments under your PFI credits or from um, members or, or, or from other stakeholders, um, because you're able to show that there is that you're um, acting in a way which complies with the guidance. Um, now, the second bullet point, I think of everything that Julie and I've said for the last um, 
40 minutes or so, I think this is probably the single biggest point I'd make, which is that there's so much talk about we need to keep services moving, we need to keep um, contractors solvent, we need to respond to COVID, we need to deal with the, 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 the crisis, right? Absolutely, completely right, of course. But at some point, we will get past this. And at some point, you're going to still have in place a contract which may have 20 years to run, right? Or more, or, or you know, or, or, or close to. Um, I, I, and what will happen at some point, I'm really sure, is that if you don't know your rights and remedies under the contract, your contractors, and more importantly, their stakeholders will. Um, and it's all very well saying, well, we're not going to treat this as a force majeure situation. We're not going to worry about a right or a remedy. We're going to waive the KPI regime. We're going to relieve the contractor from performance. That's all fine. But what I would say to you is please do know what it is you're waiving. Know what your right would have been. Know what the party's um, relationship, what, how the contract would have worked and then consciously waive those things, consciously move away from it. Don't just put the contract to one side and, uh, and agree things for now, because what will happen is that later on, when everything gets back to normal, or whatever normal looks like, um, the contractors are going to be able to say, well, actually, you've set a precedent or you've waived a right or here's our claim. All right. So you need to know if you're going to waive an obligation, if you're going to, 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 to um, deal with something in a particular way um, do, do um, make sure that you know what, what it is that the context the landscape context in which we, you're acting uh, even if you then put that aside uh, even if you say to each other right we think this is a force majeure situation or we don't or we think this is a change of law or we don't right see how the landscape work you know lies does the contract agree? Don't they agree? Would you have had a, a dispute or wouldn't you? What are you waving? What aren't you waving? And so on. A um, couple of people I've spoken to have been slipped up recently where they thought they'd agreed something with the contractor and then realised they hadn't put emergency governance into place and had to spend time going through authorities that they, they didn't have expect. So don't forget as well as managing your PFI contract to manage the other way as well and, and make sure your authority is in place and actually make sure the contractor's got authority in place as well from banks, particularly um, if they're if they're green changes that they've got approvals and so on. Right, so this is something that's really important. I've touched on it already, but Julie and I both feel very strongly that if you are going to put um, an arrangement into place, the best way to do this at the moment in this context is to put together a modification deed. Now, some people are calling these variation deeds or deeds of variation exactly the same thing. It's just a title. I like to call them modification deeds because it distinguishes it from other variations, business as normal variations, and also it emphasises that you're doing it within the context of Regulation 72. All right, and some of the ingredients that I think are important um, is to, to make clear it's time limited, right? what, what you're relieving the contractor for a specific length of time. By all means, include a review provision, but don't just leave it open-ended. Um, second bullet, recite the remedies that are being used or waived. So this is the point I was just making, you know, you, you acknowledge that there is a change of law or there's not a change of law. You acknowledge that the change control procedure would have said you should have done X, right? But then you explain to what extent those things are not being um, taken into account. So, you know, you accept that the modification deed is, for example, treated as if the change control procedure had been complied with. All right, so you're not ignoring the contract you're doing something acknowledging the contract. Um, do make sure you've put a clause in the modification deed to make clear that everything you're doing is exhaustive of all the rights and remedies, right? or not, as the case may be, if you're excluding something. right? Because what you don't want to happen is you think you've agreed something with the contract, so you're, you, know, you continue to go and then you get a claim later because you didn't sort of tidy up a, a loose end. Um, Lots of people have been talking to me about this. Um, so about can we just waive the KPI regime? And the responses that we've been thinking is, well, by and large, it's not about 
um, waiving the whole thing. You know, there's parts of the KPI regime or the performance framework that a contractor should and could continue to apply with, comply with. So what we've suggested and lots of people are doing are, are sort of con contingency KPIs or contingency performance frameworks. So you're replacing what is the normal regime with something specific to the period of the modification. So you can still enforce the things that you need to enforce, but you're waiving the things that can't be done. A period of review I've touched on. Don't forget transparency. So this is both the open books, the transparency between you and the contractor, and then obviously transparency to the extent relevant under FOI, or if you're an environmental project, the EIO as well. Um, and this last one in bold, um, so you've got no better, no worse. I mean, you, you guys as, as dealing with PFIs absolutely know what we mean by no better, no worse, right? but it's quite important. It's, it's what we were saying earlier is that this isn't an opportunity for the contractor to be better off or make more profit right? any more than it's an opportunity or a, a problem for him to, to be um, hurt by things. So it, it it should be on a no better, no worse basis. Now, obviously, there's two ways you can do that. You can either use your um, base case um, amendment provisions and, and resolve to your IRR. Um, but that, of course, means that you're preserving the profit under the contract. He's not making additional profit, but you're preserving where he was. Or you ring fence it and you just pay a lump sum or a, a, a monthly or weekly payment just to rectify the thing or, 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 or deal with the the thing in front of you. Um, but do think about what I said earlier about um, potentially having some sort of reconciliation at the end of the year if things have turned out to be worse or, or, or not as bad as expected. Um, uh, just some things to think about here. Um, I mean, these are all, again, PFI concepts that you will have been really familiar with when you let your contracts. Um, some of these you, you put in the, you know, the biggest debated things when we negotiated these deals that hopefully never saw the light of day again and, and may still not. But just have a little, you know, reserve a little corner of your mind for them. So we've got record interest rates. I mean, record low interest rates, not great in many ways, but have you thought about refinancing gain? You know, what was the interest rate when you closed the project? I mean, this might be a really good opportunity to think about refinancing. Um, you know, there might be something in that for the contractor as well, because if you refinanced either, you know, the authority paying some of the cash or uh, some of the some of the capex or or, or refinancing with a different bank. Um, and it might be that um, actually there's a bit of gain for the contractor as well. And that which sort of maybe gets some equity out of the project. Um, Stepping rights is something that I, I keeps cropping up. So a couple of clients have said to me, uh, if we stop the contractor performing because we've closed the accommodation or whatever, is that a, the authority exercising a step in right? Um, and I don't think it is. I mean, a step in right means you're actually actively, I think my interpretation is that you're actively doing something. You're not just stopping them doing it. So I think that's much more force majeure or a, an authority change type territory. Um, liquid market, I mentioned only because if we play hardball and any of these contractors go bust, um, obviously you'll know that under your um, a PFI contracts, most likely if there's a contractor default termination that you have to decide whether there's a liquid market or not. And if there isn't a liquid market, then it's an expert, an expert who values the contract and you have to pay the contractor out for that value. Now, um, that's if it's a, and that's that would obviously apply in an in, an, in an insolvency situation unless the force measure provisions apply. Now, I suppose the word of caution across the whole market is it's not going to help anyone if we force contractors out of business because then not only are we going to have a problem with all of our contracts, but there won't be a liquid market either. So um, I think this is at the heart of what the um, cabinet office's guidance is all about preserving preserving the market and the supply chain. And can subcontractor warranties now is a good time. If you've got subcontractors performing big parts of the PFI, now is a really good time to make sure you've got those warranties into place and you know who the subcontractors are, not because you might claim on them, but because you might need to step into them if the main contractor for any reason has a, has a problem. Um, I'm just going to summarise that um, because uh, it, it summarise that to one extent, which is 
what you have heard is that in a sense, it doesn't really matter whether this is treated as a force majeure, a change of law, step in, authority change, contracts a change. The reality is it's almost that all roads lead to Rome because ultimately what you're doing is you're putting the contractor back on his feet into a place where he's no better or no worse off. And I think the, the thing to bear in mind is that's what you're doing. And I don't think we spend too much energy wondering which road got us to that place. What's more important is that we deal with the outcome, the, 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 out, um, the outcome. And, and, and the agreed solution. But like I say, notwithstanding that, it's important to know what you've waived, what you didn't do, and just make sure you've tidied that all up. So that's just a reminder of the resources that Julie and I have spoken about, the IPA guidance, you've seen all of these, the Government Contractual Behaviour Guidance, the 7th of May, that's so the first one's IPA, second one's Cabinet Office, then the two CCS ones. The Government Commercial Function Outsourcing Playbook, you can just Google that, um, it's really handy. I don't think ignore it just because you've already got your contracts in place. It's got some really good stuff around resolution planning. And then we've got our own library. If you go on our website, uh, which is there at the bottom of the page, um, we've got a whole library of materials um, across every subject from planning to um, the, the, the latest advice on data breaches. Um, so, so you've got that there. And we're, continuously updating that. Um, if you want more, there's even more. There's that, there's our special edition of our Sharp Richard Focus. And obviously, Julie and I are always happy, very happy indeed to, to help out and answer questions. So um, I'll leave you thinking about this little picture. And I, I'm, I'm going to um, quickly, we've, we've almost run out of time actually, but I don't know whether Julie, you can see the questions while I just log out of the slides. Is there anything that we... Yes, there's yes. been about, about whether a, a PFI contractor might be able to claim loss of income due to business interruption. I mean, yes. I suspect the, the, the it's again, aside from the fact that at the end of the day, we are looking at the sort of territory where we're trying to allow service continuity. And if indeed that is um, a, a head of loss that is really affecting the contractor, I suspect we're going back down the sort of modification deed and working out what will help um, the contractor to continue. But I think yes. if we're looking straight at the kind of contractual um, sort of enforcement or hardline approach, I guess it really depends on what what is stated in your contract about things like loss of income is business interruption ahead of of, of any um, exciting cause. Yeah, I don't know what you think, Rose. Yeah, no, Joe, I agree. Julie, I don't know whether, sorry, Julie Jackson, <laughs> the person asked the question. I don't, I, I, I think by that you probably mean loss of third party income. Um, and if, if you mean loss of third party income, the answer is probably in most cases, as Julie said, is going to be no, um, because um, third party income is a contractor risk. Um, if there is a, uh, the, there might be business interruption insurance among the project insurances, but like I say, that's quite li un likely, even that's being resisted by the insurance market. Um, so if the loss of income, is resulted from the sort of macro COVID situation and it's not a change of law and it's not force majeure. In other words, it doesn't fit into any of those particular categories, then I think that is a contractor risk and a very good example of why a contractor might come and say, notwithstanding the fact that we haven't got a, a protection, can you put, put us on a no better, no worse situation for a period until we're back on our feet? And that's a very good example of where I'd say if you agree to do so, do it over, cast over a longer period with a um, reconciliation, because depending, and I don't know um, what your contract is, but it, depending on the nature of the service or the nature of the um, uh, contract, there may be more income to come later down the line. And so you don't want to be compensating them now and then finding that they actually get the income later. Super, are there, that was, that was great. Well, I think we have just um, hit our time, just dot on. So I just want to say a huge thank you to my colleague, Julie, who I have to say did a very um, large part of all of the work for this. So I'm very grateful. Um, and it's lovely to see those of you, the names that have come up. I'm very um, pleased to see how many of uh, familiar names there and new ones too. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>